So we're very happy to have Carl Evans, who's come up from Stoke on Trent, and uh, he's a former national president of the Institute of Baths and Recreation Management. He started his local government career in Manchester Baths and Laundries Department as a lifeguard in 1971. He worked in most of Manchester's baths establishment and held several management positions in Manchester, Nottingham and Stoke-on-Trent, leaving his position as Deputy Director in 1999. He also worked for several years as a sport and leisure consultant before starting his own retail business. He is semi-retired, serves as a business mentor with Staffordshire Chambers of Commerce and has an interest in politics and social history. Carol is married with four children and five grandchildren. Uh, his publications, Health and Fitness Centres, A Guide to Their Management and Operation, long as 1992, and a contributor to Practical Leather Centre Management, Volume 2, Institute of Baths and Recreation Management. Sounds very impressive. <laughs> um, thank you for, for inviting me to be here today. It's um, a real privilege to, to come to this venue. The Baths and Wash Houses um, archive is, is the subject of my talk today. Um, and this is a project that I guess goes back a long, long time. Um, it's um, an accessible website for everybody. Um, it's accessible to you at home, you can go in there, you can make comments, you can add material. Uh, and the idea is that it uh, allows people to uh, appreciate what went before and possibly learn from what went in the past to inform the future. So, I want to, what I want to do today is just summarise and talk about how the archive came about, uh, what are the merits of keeping the memories of people alive and accessible, what's the purpose in terms of having this thing out there on the internet, who contributes to the archive, um, what's in it, um, and then how might you be able to help, but also how might the archive and its uh, contributors help you. The archive itself gets between 50 and 100 hits a week, which for an unusual topic is quite good, I'm told. Okay, so how did it come about? I guess the first thing is, um, Seedley Bath sits on the right hand side of your screen, that's where I learned to swim in Salford. It a, was a very impressive building, though at my age at that time I didn't realise that that was the case. Um, we walked there from school every week for about half an hour to three quarters of an hour, had our swimming lessons and went back again. So that's not too dissimilar to lots of other people. Uh, Broadway Baths was the, uh, the place where I joined the swimming club and got heavily involved with things. Harper Hay Baths was where I was my first uh, job as a lifeguard, and Moss Side Baths, I ended up living there for about 12 months when I first got married. Interesting place, Moss Side. Um, but this, this kind of is a background. I, I seem to have swimming pools inside me somehow. Um, but you can also see from Douglas's point of view the changes of the architecture. And sometimes these buildings went from very ornate to very simple, and in some cases quite austere. Well, the hay bath was particularly austere, next to a tram station, so um, it's there. And Moss Side Baths was one of these places similar to here where the Moss Side District Council built it and then it was swallowed up by Manchester City Council within about four or five years. So those, that's my own background and what I saw was um, material being thrown away. Uh, when I worked in Manchester, the Department of Baths and Wash Houses amalgamated with parks, and I saw material being thrown away, and I started to collect it. And one of the items is on the table over there, brought some items so you can have a look at. It's a history of Al from Albert Teasdale, who was the general manager of Manchester Baths and Wash Houses Department for 25 years, and he wrote a personal history. Uh, that's one copy. Uh, the other copy is supposed to be in Manchester Central Library, but nobody can find it. It is available in the archive in full, you can download it and enjoy the reading of it. Uh, the other reason that the archive exists as a website is because of Malcolm Schifrin. Uh, Malcolm has a, another website which looks at Turkish baths. It's in age about 17 years old, 
uh, and so it's been going a long time. Uh, Malcolm's just produced a book that's been uh, published by um, Historic England. It's a fantastic publication about Turkish baths, full of pictures, very interesting. He'd really like some photographs of Turkish baths from Scotland. He hasn't been able to obtain any. So if anybody has any, be welcome in. Um, great person to deal with. I've actually met lots of people on the internet as a result of the, uh, the website. Nice to see you here today. So what's the merit of keeping these memories alive? Um, I basically asked colleagues who contributed to the website, and Sylvia sat here today. She didn't know I was going to mention her. Um, and we've never met, but we've, we've looked at the work that she's done. Um, Research Associate in Sport and Leisure History at Manchester Metropolitan University. I think it's very important because knowledge and information in universities stays in universities. Anyone else struggles to find it. Very good point. Doesn't make it necessarily accessible. But if you do make it accessible, it's amazing how people will contribute. I think the accurate historical information is very valuable, even if only some people get excited about it. And I watched a YouTube video of her giving a presentation. Um, Jill, Gillian Mawson is a, an author about uh, mainly evacuees from Guernsey. But the funny thing is, because of her research, she sent an article about the evacuees' experience in swimming pools in the UK as a result of her research. I think what she said is important. The collection of oral history is always dependent on the dedication and passion for researchers who wish to collect the testimonials before they are lost to us forever. So the voices of the past can be heard for future generations. She also said it's important to do it now because in her research, within 10 years, most of the people she'd interviewed were no longer with us. So that's an important thing to do. So what's the purpose? Well, it's about sharing memories and historical material relating to baths and washing houses, which is one thing. Most of the material that's published is about the buildings. It's about pictures of the swimming pools of the laundries. It's amazing how many of them don't have people in. And yet it's the people that were instrumental in their building. Many, many lives existed around and in those buildings and people have campaigned to keep them open as you are doing today. So from my point of view, it's an interest that I have, uh, but it's based upon not the architecture, it's based upon the fact that these buildings were the lifeblood uh, for many, many people. So who contributes to it? Well, lots of people contribute to it. Even people that are no longer alive, because people send letters that their parents wrote. Uh, and that was the case in the, with respect to I'm in Sylvester. Sort of the letter was sent to me because someone had seen something about Harper Hay Bats. Irene in her letter describes the residence above the bat and her experience as a child living in it. It's a fascinating piece of work. Um, Stephen Rock uh, sent his thesis that he wrote for his university degree. Um, Francis, who I'll come on to shortly, basically wrote a dissertation about women and the wash house in Manchester. Uh, and so everybody contributes and if you look at a particular local place you can track down and see the comments of people underneath and that incidentally is how you ended up with Douglas being here today because he made a comment on the website Paul asked me how do I contact him and here he is because he said something on the website so what's in the archive well the first thing is there's lots of material what I want to do is draw attention to this one. I mentioned Albert Teasdale earlier. His only piece of work uh, that sits with the archive, you can read it. But look at these words here. This was a, an article he wrote uh, in October 1945. Probably there's not one in a hundred of the citizens of this country who for five minutes on end has reflected on the part which our public baths play in keeping life clean and wholesome. 
He goes on to say that, uh, or say that it's only when these places are lost do people take an interest. Um, Francis, Francis produced a piece of work um, in 2000 where she undertook primary research and interviewed women who had used Manchester's wash houses. Brilliant piece of work. It uh, has quotations in from the, pe from the women themselves. And she goes on to say that it's interesting that the people who were using these places did not have a say in them being built. Nor did they have a say in how they were managed or operated. Um, and in her research, it's an important point she made. Um, it might have actually been a conversation with me that the men had an interest in the fabric of the building, the women had an interest in using it. And so that's, that's fascinating for itself. It's a worth a read, it's on the website. It, wasn't be, it wouldn't naturally be available because the Manchester University Library couldn't find the copy when I wanted it. So it's been put on the website, she sent it to me, I copied it, she's got several bound copies back with electronic copies, so she can now circulate it to people. So it's making things available. Historical material, when the Institute of Sport and Recreation Management finally merged um, with other institutes to form uh, a chartered institute, all of its archives were being discarded. Um, I managed to obtain all of the publications of Baths and Baths Engineering from the very first one, right the way through to when we ceased all the conference reports, and most fascinating, the rough minutes of the Association of Bath Superintendents when it was being formed. Once again, on the website, available for you to look at, and I brought a photocopy of that here with me today. Um, sometimes we think of wash houses starting with Kitty Wilkinson in Liverpool, but they were also available before that in other forms. You had the the North Parish Washing Green Society, established in Glasgow. There is a website for it, it does exist today. You can subscribe to be a member if you wish. It's a charitable organisation. Um, the website has a lot of photographs. Um, these are uh, Manchester's wash houses, but they were similar throughout the country. These barrel washing machines were in use when I started working in New Islington Baths in Manchester, run by steam power conveyor belts, and that's the old washing machines. Uh, the ladies would uh, load the washing machines and then the baths uh, washhouse men would operate all the valves and make things work. Um, very much like factories, industrial in nature. Um, particularly like the photograph of the, the sunlight coming through, puts a whole wonderful glamour on the, the, whole, the whole thing. I'm sure it wasn't like that. And my experience of actually being one of those men who made the washing machines work, it was very hard work. Because if you didn't put the soap powder in at the right time in the wash, the women got very upset. Um, and you have to put the washing machine powder in and the soda in at the right time in the cycle. And to operate some of the lever valves, you'd have a piece of wood to knock them off as you went past every machine. It was pretty hard work. Um, and the, the women were, some of them were professional in terms of they would be in there every day collecting washing from different people's houses uh, and then delivering it back to the houses later in the day. So some of these places, I don't know if this happened in Glasgow, it probably did, um, but you, you had that kind of thing going on. The other thing to bear in mind is that swimming baths weren't always swimming baths. Uh, you would see this at Victoria Baths in Manchester, uh, where the main swimming pool was floored over and it would become a public hall for the winter, uh, where balls would take place, dances. Um, the uh, parents of a friend of mine used to hire Broadway baths to organise dances in, in New Moston in Manchester every, every winter. Um, and so there is a whole area of discussion about public baths as recreational facilities. So this would be floored over and used possibly uh, for some other purpose. 
Interesting that that's going on, going on now to preserve them. And the first, some of the first gymnasiums were badminton courts were laid out in public swimming pools. And you'd play. This was quite good if we did it here. But in some cases you would avoid the, the metal struts going across the ceiling. Um, area of, of work that isn't written about very much. I haven't found in very much other than an archive uh, in Birmingham which talks about the development of public halls in that. Then you've also got technology. Um, the photograph of the, the child being irradiated uh, with sun lamps it was all to do with uh, prevention of rickets. Happened in Glasgow. Uh, one of my closest friends, Angus Carmichael, was born in Glasgow, went to swimming baths in Glasgow, and went for his weekly sun lamp as a school child in Glasgow. Um, Portobello open air bathing pool, first swimming pool to have wave machines. Uh, there's a little article on the website by somebody who worked there, um, who was a supervisor, um, who explains that the wave machine was so loud and shook the building so much that it was eventually turned off because of fears of undermining the foundations. <laughs> but it, it was the first piece of technology that produced waves in swimming pools. It also um, demonstrated the problems with wave machines because people could be uh, pulled off their feet and taken back down the pool in the, the flow of the return flow and he talks about being a lifeguard being very busy pulling people out uh, but those are those are experiences that when I when I did a, a health and safety study for the consumers association of swimming pools around the UK I was experiencing exactly those problems in wave machines that were quite modern 20 years ago and you think we would have solved the problems but sometimes we don't look at the past. Um, the other aspect which is quite interesting um, is that people did go to college to learn how to be bats managers from about the 1980s, 90s, 1970s onwards, sorry. Uh, South East London Technical College ran a course for bats managers. This has produced a lot of comments because you put people in photographs of people up there and it produces results as you were telling me earlier. Um, memories from the past influence the future. This is quite a modern piece of work that is just a, a pamphlet. Um, but this pamphlet is kind of uh, related to what you're doing now. You're attempting to preserve a building. This is a history um, that I'm shortly to put up on the website that describes the campaign and activities over a 10 year period of people to get the swimming pool built. And it's very detailed. If you were to look at the, the pamphlet itself, it's over there on the table, you might not think it's worth a read. But if you want to engage in a campaign, it's a very, very informative piece of work. Uh, they did get their swimming pool built, and you can see down here them celebrating 50 years. Um, of the project being completed in Melton Mowbray. Fascinating piece of work. Talks all about the dances, the balls, the fates, the, pol the politics of who wanted it and who didn't. So how might you help? Well, I think it's more a case of if you're interested in helping yourselves. Because in your campaign, this kind of information can be useful to you. Uh, you can search it, uh, you can add to what this is doing, uh, we can put a Govan Hill, with those links there to Govan Hill Baths I think, if there isn't we can set it up. We're getting 50 to 100 hits a week, it's worth looking at it and I can research the old magazines and see if we've got some older historical information about the place. Um, so really this is facilitates whatever you want it to be and for me it's a personal project it'd be nice to find some funding for it because it gets quite expensive from time to time um, but it's it's there it can help lots of individuals and you can be a contributor I was talking to a lady last week who contacted me about wanting to put material on it um, her first name was Sarah but she was concerned that she wanted to rewrite her dissertation 
to be able to publish it. Um, if you're of that mind, please don't. Uh, because the primary research is really useful and don't go to the, the trouble of doing it. The more information that's there, then the more will people read. Uh, so don't put off what you can do today by just sending it. Don't put off for 20 years rewriting something. Just do it. That would be really nice. Um, so thank you very much. Um, so what we've done is all of that, I hope. Um, so thank you for listening. There's some interesting articles on the table if you'd like to have a look over lunch. Thanks very much. I'm just wondering if anybody wants to ask any questions to... I don't know which of you might be able to answer this. I just, you, you mentioned the quality of the water in the pools, and presumably when they were fresh, but there were not already the water, so how, how often was the water changed? And just from a practical point of view, how did they... Um, it varied from month to month, actually. Um, some of them seem to have been changed two or three times a week. Other ones it was longer than that before they changed it. They did have sort of fairly crude methods of trying to treat the water by taking um, a long, long pulled devices with a, a ball of chemicals in it. Um, so I don't know if you maybe got more information on what they actually used, but I think it's magnesium hydrochloride, uh, possibly, is one of the chemicals that was used, um, and just dragged it over, over the water initially in the very early pools until they actually were able to properly filter it. Um, I think some of you were talking earlier about the fill and empty system, whereby you were uh, being charged more on a Monday, say, because the water was changed on a Sunday. Uh, Victoria Bats and Artes as well, with tanks on the roof, which made it a lot easier to do that because they weren't paying for the water. Um, chlorination came in quite early, actually, in, in swimming pool filtration times because the water industry had already introduced it. Um, lots of swimming pool technology came from the public water um, establishments, and they started to chlorinate water quite early. And so Wallace and Tiernan, um, as a company, was putting chlorination systems into waterworks, and so it was an easy matter to move them into swimming pools. Um, and filtration arrived in the early 1900s, uh, one of the first sets of filters were in New Islington Baths in Manchester, which were rectangular slabs of steel. They were still in use in the 1970s uh, before they were replaced. And lots of different chemicals were tried. Because um, the only interesting thing is, that, did any of you ever get sore eyes as a result of swimming? That was because there wasn't enough chemical in the water and you were swimming with people's. Anyway. <laughs> We were still basically working on fill and empty. Um, so most Victorian Edwardian pools full the pool with, it, with fresh water, swim it till it's too dirty, to drain it out, start again. Um, and like I can also said, you could filter the water before you use it get any grit out. Um, <coughs> it's out. But at Victoria Bath they, they, they realised that you could also do some basic treatment to the water so you could reuse it. Um, so they worked out that you could um, um, not, instead of just putting it down the drain after a few days, you could pump it out, refilter it, get the bits out, lots of bits come from the human body, and that's what the system is still used today. That's one of the main things you have to do to treat pool water is get the bits out that come off human bodies. Um, so refilter it and, and aerate it, so you put just through a fountain, and by introducing oxygen, it reduces the level of bacteria in the water, um, reheat it, and put it back into a swimming pool. Um, and so they had a system of Victoria Baths where you could actually reuse the water. So, so although they were using sort of fill and empty, they were doing fill empty and refill. So you could be refilled with fresh water or you could be refilled with used water. When they say the water went into our first class pool, pumped back, filtered, aerated, put into our second class pool, pumped back, filtered and aerated and put into our female pool. <laughs> personally, personally, I think that's an open myth, but we think they were in this water. It's documented that they were reusing the water, that they had the system in place. 
um, and, um, but definitely there was clean and dirty days. And again, that was quite normal. But, um, our pools were filled twice a week because our pools were busy, what the swimmers doing them. So the women's pool, for example, was filled on a Monday and a Thursday, um, and Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday and Friday, the first class days, relatively from fresh water. Wednesdays and Saturdays, the water a bit cloudy, maybe a bit sunny, second class days. And those, those sort of first and second class days were quite normal until we got chlorination, which is 1930 in Manchester, we started chlorinating. So the water is always now fresh and inviting. One of the things you see when you're researching is the occurrence of something called the Royals Patent Filtration System, um, which crops up in a number of the descriptions of maths, but uh, it's something that you can really look into because I wasn't able to find out tremendous amount of information about it. Um, it's certainly, there, there's one description which I think is on the system, which basically is a, it's, it's a, both an aeration and a filtration system. It took the water up to the top of the building, put it through some plates and then through some kind of bed to actually filter out the solids and then back into the pool. So those were being put in at a fairly early stage. Uh, I, oh, no, I, say, I think I might say there's Turkish baths in Bonnet Ford baths. Oh, sorry. Yes. I was going to ask about the Turkish yes. baths, am I right? Yeah, because I had the privilege of being able to go and visit it, and I just think it's wonderful. It might be austere, but I think it's stunning. To me, it looks the same as it did in your picture. It might, it's got a bit of graffiti in it, yeah. but it's all yeah. still there. It's amazing, and I don't know if your trust is supporting the reopening. We're, we're, well, we're, we're trying to facilitate them to, to move things forward. Yeah, know. yeah. I'd say that, that that's got a Turkish bus, so that maybe to get some pictures of that to send to Mark. Yeah, and that, and certainly when I went round with somebody from the group, I don't think they realised they had a Turkish bus there. Yeah. So another possible selling point for its reopening and restoration. Uh, I just wanted to say to Carol how much I love the bus and wash house. It's not a good work I was at Glasgow Uni recently doing a a uh, dissertation that ended up being about uh, the archives of local historic pools and that was a real great source of information, place to go. Anything that's ever been written about Bath and Wash Houses is listed. Because I was really going to ask Sylvie, Sylvia if she wanted to say something because Carol mentioned her work in uh, this presentation. Sure. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I'm a research associate, which basically means I, I research and the uni kind of takes some of the credit for maybe giving me some access to some of the archives, some of the uh, online resources that they have. Uh, so I started off using the Bath and Wash House archive just to kind of get a general idea of what's going on in my kind of time period, in my area, and what I found was actually really interesting and sparked lots of kind of ideas of where to move forward, so this is kind of why I really enjoyed using the archive. And one of the things that I researched is really early baths and wash houses in Manchester, so 1840s. Um, so it's not the, not the first ones, but they're also not quite far behind. And it's quite hard to kind of trace some of the baths and wash houses because the records are quite diverse and they're kind of in lots of different places. Um, just getting a general overview was really nice and then kind of saying, okay, so I know roughly from the last uh, archive what happened, so let's actually go into the archive and fill it out with more information. Um, and so that's what I did. So if you're interested, there's a video of me talking in Victoria about last year uh, about the evils preserved in the value of cleanliness, which is basically a the kind of narratives around building baths and wash houses in Manchester in the 1840s and to the 1870s. So this is before the corporation took over. So these are all um, baths and wash houses that were built in private hands, they're built by companies, they're sometimes built by what we would now call a trust, I think. Um, and generally what was happening in the city at the time. So on YouTube, if you put that in, you can find me. Um, and can hear the people upstairs in Victoria Maths talking about that. So that's all fun. Here you go. So I think one of the things that you did, um, which you haven't told anybody about, is you transcribed yes, the entire Royal Charter of the Manchester Baths and Salford. Laundry's Company. Laundry's Company. Yes, um, and that's on the website as well. And that is a very interesting task in itself. But a fascinating read of an old royal chart. So well done to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, we're just getting ready for lunch, actually. Um, so, thanks a lot. See you in a minute.